So welcome to the revolution. Um, and most revolutions don't start with uh, flutes and uh, nice dainty parfaits, but this one is. And we really, really appreciate uh, you being here. And this is what the revolution is about. This revolution is about Florida, Tampa Bay, industry partners, patient partners, physician, nurses, public health professionals getting together and saying, we're going to transform the reality of healthcare. We're not going to wait for somebody else to do it. And the transformation is happening right here in Tampa Bay. We built this, and really we have built USF Health around one simple model, that you never transform things by changing the existing reality. To transform something, make a new reality which makes the old way obsolete. This is the largest freestanding assessment of technical and teamwork competence center in the world. Not in Florida, not in the nation, but in the world. So I'm going to be very brief because I want you to know what this isn't. This is not just a simulation center. This is not just about technical competence. This is literally changing the way that we look at how physicians, nurses, and other healthcare professionals work together. It's basically taking the lead in learning from our mistakes. It's taking the lead in looking at new technologies and making sure that everyone that, that is behind a robot or a fantastic new device is competent to do it. And it's taking the lead in making sure that the way we train students and, and, and residents is the way of the future and not the way of the past. The second piece is around technical competence. I did get a chance to, to meet with, with folks in, in Washington. And these are just three facts that when it, unlike aviation, if you have a pilot with a problem, there are ways of simulating whether or not that person is, is competent. Uh, we don't have that in hospitals. I've told people this before. Hopefully none of you are my patients, but the last time that I uh, got my technical competence assessed was 1984, and that's true of any doctor sitting in this room that's my age. We're changing that, and we're working with industry partners to do, to do that. We're also making sure that whenever there is a new piece of technology, and you're going to hear from some of our technology partners and some of the specialty societies, that the person that's using it is not only competent to use it, but literally is leading the way in using it. And we're going to be the first center in the country that's really able to come up with those objective parameters. And then finally, we're going to change the whole philosophy of, of, of how we teach residents. Instead of see one, do one, teach one, which has been that way for 30 years, which is fine unless you're the one on the other end, we're going to make sure that before a resident gets in front of a patient that they've had a chance to really practice their skills. Um, I talk a lot about aviation, and you're going to hear a lot out of this center around partnerships with aviation. But you just assume when you walk into the plane that your pilot is competent because you know that he or she has been, uh, has been tested. And this is an eight-year-old that actually wrote this letter. Even she knew it. Dear Captain, my name is Nicola. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the clouds go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight. Don't mm, up the landing. So even Nicola. <laughs> Even Nicola uh, knew that. So uh, we, want, we want Nicola to know that when we're operating on her, uh, that we're going to do that. And we're wor working with our partners literally, literally to create procedure rehearsal studios. So that literally our physicians, our nurses will be able to practice not only the technical aspects, but the teamwork aspects of a procedure before they do the procedure. You know, pr pilots don't talk about, I'm, I'm in the practice of piloting. They pilot. Okay, we have to stop talking about medicine as a practice. So you're going to be wowed, wowed when you go through our, our, our simulation center and see uh, some, some of, uh, of, of what we've done. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to helping uh, lead that. And then the last thing is, and I know it's something that uh, a lot of us have been passionate about, is we have to start to learn from our mistakes. Doctors make mistakes, nurses make mistakes, but we have way too many mistakes that get repeated. Readmissions, a good part of the reason that we have to have the kind of reform that, that we're looking at is because we haven't done a good enough job of learning from our mistakes and preventing readmissions.
So, um, I hope my kids aren't here. That, uh, but um, uh, not, not dissimilar to that, uh, to that uh, gentleman, we, uh, we got a wake-up call uh, in the Ta'ara's Human uh, Treaties around how many uh, mistakes and readmissions are done. And we are committed to working with the partners that you see here to make sure that the next generation of docs knows that while they might make a mistake, it's not going to get replicated because I have a chance to, to practice right here at, at Camels. And we really are going to be on a global passion with our partners around talking about practicing safe surgery. So uh, this is not the end. This is uh, the start of a revolution. And I put this little iPod up here because uh, as, for those of you who read the Harvard Business Review piece that um, Isaacson did on Steve Jobs looking at the business lessons from his biography, this was really the key. When he came out with this in June of 2000, everybody said, you're going to build this company around an iPod? No, what he saw is that 10 years from that point, we were going to have an I lifestyle. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of many camels. Camels will become a brand identity around quality and safety, not just in this country, but in the world. And you'll get to see some very important announcements today about how we're going to start to make that happen. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let uh, the folks that are uh, really important do some of the talking. And I just really want you to see what you're about to, uh, uh, to witness. So. Catas is a vehicle for healthcare transformation and quality and safety. What's great about it is that the assessing skills, as skills need to change, whether that's technical skills or teamwork skills, we can do that. We can elevate quality and safety for patients at the bedside while improving efficiency across the healthcare delivery system for all health professionals as individuals and as teams. See, healthcare in America is moving towards coordinated teamwork approaches to patient care, and CAMELS will be at the forefront of teaching these methods. It is fabulous. This is like giving birth. This is a process that has evolved over six years with intense planning and working with multiple partners. So this is like this is like a dream come true. The purpose of Virtual Patient Care Center is really to give us the ability to simulate our life in the, in the hospital or in the outpatient setting. So we want a what we call a synthetic learning environment for our learners so that they can come and practice what they do every day but not practice the patients. Mm -hmm. Well, our goal is to lead that revolution with innovation. Our goal is that we bring engineering and business leaders and healthcare providers under one roof. We can really be innovative in how we go about changing the current paradigm of, of the way doctors are trained, of our current solutions to performing surgery or performing typical procedures within medicine. The technology is dazzling, but what's most important to me is the positive impact it would have on, on patient care. Went down to University of South Florida, and I could not believe the things that they're doing down there. This Camels uh, Simulation Center is, there's a lot of great simulation going on, but this is one place where it's all together, and it's even all together for the team. You've got nurses doing their kind of simulation, pharmacists doing their kind of simulation, doctors, and proceduralists. Very, very exciting stuff. It's really matching uh, strategies that are enormously effective um, with with the medical profession, and that's good news for everybody. This is great. I mean, this is really exciting for downtown, and I just want more. I want more buildings with USF open lights, uh, so the entire world can see that the bulls are here and the bulls are downtown, and we're doing great. So at least one person's not totally satisfied yet, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll get a chance to hear from you. Um, so welcome, welcome to CAMELS, and, and you'll get to see CAMELS is our uh, surgical and education training center, CAMELS is our virtual patient care center, CAMELS is the Tampa Bay Research and Innovation Center, CAMELS is our virtual pharmacy, and CAMELS is a lot more than all that. Uh, I was telling the folks yesterday uh, evening uh, that it helped to partner with us that um, uh, I'm an obstetrician, I've delivered over 2,000 babies. Um, this uh, is uh, the longest gestation of any baby that I've ever been part of, about six years. Uh, it's also, uh, other than my three children, the one that I'm most proud of. 
And uh, unlike my three children, uh, this one had multiple partners. And I'd like to thank the, um, <laughs> I'd like to just thank uh, generally some folks. We got a chance to thank some individuals. There are a few individuals that I just want to acknowledge to start. Uh, first of all, when you saw my name, uh, you saw that I am the dean of uh, the Marsani College of Medicine at USFL. Uh, that is a title that I hold very, very proudly, uh, partly because it's USF, uh, but really uh, very much because it's uh, the Marsani College of Medicine. To have my name associated with Carolyn Frank Marsani is uh, something that I could never uh, ask for anything more. So, I'd like to ask Carolyn Frank to stand up, please. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge a good part of what we're doing is uh, really working with everybody. I mean, that's what's really neat about this. But one of the things we're most excited about working with is the military. Uh, you'll get to meet John Armstrong, who's our medical director. He comes uh, from uh, a medical simulation in the Army. But I want to introduce uh, one of the folks that we've been working with and his team, uh, Major General Robert Kosolke, who's the uh, commanding general of the U.S. Army Medical Reserves. Uh, Major General? And I want to thank you and all your colleagues for everything you do every day. We, we, really, we really appreciate it. Um, uh, this, uh, this happened with a lot, a lot of friends. And I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, and we'd be here all day if I did it individually. But uh, uh, we've had a lot of uh, support and help uh, from folks throughout Florida. And, and uh, the folks that are here from the Florida legislature, could you please stand up? Thanks for everything you do for, uh, for Tampa Bay. Uh, we have uh, several uh, Hillsborough County Commissioners. Uh, could you folks stand up? <laughs> City Council members, thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge, I'm, building this building is not easy. And the, the, the level of cooperation we got from the city and, and the county, and certainly once Mayor Buckhorn got here, but also former Mayor Pam Iorio uh, really was a major champion of this. So we've just had fantastic support. So thank you all. <laughs> One of the most exciting things about this is that we are partnering with the best global companies in the world. And the, the neat thing is I've gotten to know these folks is uh, from our partners, whether it's the simulation companies or the medical device companies, they really believe in this. They are here because they believe that we can do a better job. It's not just about selling uh, machines or robots. It's really about doing the, the best job that they can. They are partners. They are not vendors. And we view ourselves the same way. So I'd like to, I got a chance to acknowledge them individually. They're all here. But I'd like our industry and simulation partners to stand up, please. I want to very much thank the Hyatt for uh, everything they did. Everything that's cool as far as the food and everything else comes to us from our good friends at the Hyatt. So I don't know if anyone's here from the Hyatt, but uh, could you stand up? Well, if not, we'll uh, do a parfait toast for you when we get outside. Thank you. <laughs> and then um, I, want to, um, I, I want to do a personal special thanks. Uh, I have, uh, and you'll get to... Uh, hear from her in a minute, uh, the, the greatest president and uh, the greatest board of trustees uh, on the planet. It's uh, frankly uh, why uh, I am now the 17th longest standing dean uh, in the United States, believe it or not, in ta uh, right here in Tampa Bay. I've uh, uh, been here for almost eight years, but uh, our board of trustees could not be more supportive. This building does not happen uh, without a board of trustees that not only is supportive, holds our feet to the fire, makes sure that everything we do, do is right, but really, really, really uh, get the vision. So I'd like to ask our board of trustees and also Lee Arnold, who's a former board member who was a major part of this, to stand up. Um, 
I want to uh, acknowledge the Board of Governors. Again, we, we're, we're a state university, uh, part of the state university system. We could not be more proud of that. We think that this is something that every Board of Governors should see, that every state legislature should see. I know Dick Beard is here, but if Dick could stand up and any other Board of Governors, I just want to thank you for everything you've done. Of course, Dick did so much for USF. Dick, I think uh, you were uh, still chair of the board when this got gestated, so uh, that, is a, that is a long gestation. Um, and, then, uh, and then finally, I, I want to thank uh, uh, the folks that make this happen. Uh, uh, Deb Sutherland has been the CEO of this effort from the very beginning. Uh, she will be the first to tell you that it is a team. Uh, and Deb and John Akaris and Fel Stubbs and the entire team at uh, USF Health has just done an amazing job to get this together along with the folks at USF. So I want Deb and her team to, to, to stand up. Okay, with that, I am very, very, very proud to introduce uh, the best boss and the best president that exists on this planet, and uh, uh, one of two people here uh, that you'll get to hear from, or three people that actually have more energy than I do, so uh, <laughs> Dr. Genshaft. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it, and, uh, and uh, I'm glad you're the longest lasting, and, and as uh, Frank Morsani said, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime, right? It's a lifetime experience. Well, welcome to everyone, and thank you for coming as I look around and I say, today the world arrives in this eight-county Tampa Bay area. Not only did I meet coming in uh, people from Veracruz, Mexico, China, Thailand, Panama, Israel, we have, we have people from all over the world that know about this uh, innovative uh, project, and uh, we're just beginning. This is, this is very, very exciting for all of us. And we have friends and partners who have, as I said, traveled around the globe to actually see this and to look at it from the perspective of, do we need these kind of uh, simulation centers elsewhere in, in the world? And these are the partnerships that make CAMELS a model for the university of the future. The model that includes great new partners. Nowadays, um, you can't stand alone. You have to have partners from around the world. And it, it also includes such an entrepreneurial spirit. And those of you, and I tell people when they come either to the campuses or come out here, just feel the spirit at USF. It is very, very exciting and there's energy and that, that really makes a difference. And we're seeing the vision that's here today. We're rewriting the future for the University of South Florida and we're rewriting the rules for all of higher education at the same time. And so together we can change the world right here and make a difference for all of, all of the people from around the world. So the kind of leadership that we see in this eight county area and nationally, the connectivity that we have with people nationally will show a, a move in the future. Um, in the years of building camels, we found a deep, deep wellspring of friends and partners in the Tampa Bay region. And CAMELS has been always a project with a global vision and a global reach, but a local strength. Um, I want to thank all of you for the advocacy that you've shown me, the university, and all that we have and we do so well in this eight county area. Um, I believe that you, everyone here, have made a difference. Made a difference for us in this region and made a difference for places like Camels to move forward and to be so innovative. So the university of the future is one that not only 
has the best practices and new discoveries, but it's also the economic engine that can make a difference. And um, it drives the type of economy that we want to see in Florida, we want to see in the Tampa Bay area, and that we want to see um, in, in, this, in this world. So it will make an impact, camels. It will put us on the global map, and it will be a place to come and see for whatever is new in the future of healthcare. So we're here to celebrate, and I want to thank, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank Steve Clasco and Deb Sutherland for persisting, staying with the project, never giving up, never giving up, because the results are phenomenal. The results are phenomenal. Thank you, and uh, go Bulls. <laughs>I want to make sure I acknowledge uh, just two other groups real quickly. Um, once you get a chance to actually uh, go through uh, this building, uh, you will be absolutely amazed at everything about this building. And um, this building uh, came on time. In fact, we got our certificate of occupancy on a Saturday and had a worldwide microsurgical neurosurgery uh, meeting uh, on Monday, uh, 24 hours later. Uh, Great group of partners, uh, uh, Mark House and the Beck Group, who actually uh, built this. We had the idea, but none of this would be here uh, without the great and professional work that they did. So Mark, could you and your group uh, stand up? And, uh, and Judy mentioned uh, some of the things that are special about our university. One of the things that I'm most proud of is that everything you see here is USF Health. Uh, and USF, not College of Medicine, not College of Nursing, not College of Public Health, not College of Engineering, because it's all of those things. Anything that's involved in health is really what we're about. And we have uh, uh, deans and chairs here, and uh, they're all part of this, and I'd love to uh, have uh, them stand up, and if the provost and senior VPs are here, that would be great also. So, you know, I read someplace that um, the favorability uh, rating of uh, Congress is not as high as it could be. And I, I was thinking the other day that um, uh, if every uh, uh, congressional uh, leader was like uh, Kathy Castor, it would be at 100.0 percent. Uh, Kathy, uh, more than anybody I've ever met, uh, gets both sides of the equation. She understands her constituents. Uh, she understands uh, what's going on in Washington and how to be effective. And really, she understands the vision. She has been an amazing champion of her district, an amazing champion of Tampa Bay, an amazing friend to USF, an amazing friend to Colleen and I personally. But most importantly, she's been a very, very effective leader, someone that everybody in Washington uh, trusts and, and looks to as a, as a future leader. And um, she has just been, from the moment we thought of this, she got excited about it and, and helped, uh, helped us make this happen. So Kathy. Personally and professionally, you are uh, a major part of this. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. What an exciting day. Uh, the, the Tampa Bay area. <laughs> you know, the, the Tampa Bay area is emerging as one of the premier health innovation capitals for this country. Uh, and USF and CAMELS are cornerstones of that emerging excellence. We are now on par with the Research Triangle in North Carolina, with what's happening in San Diego and Scripps, with the big medical research complexes in Bethesda, Maryland, and in Boston, Massachusetts. And CAMELS now is going to propel us uh, to the forefront. And what it will take uh, and what it has taken to get here is innovation, a focus on grants and research, where we're very aggressive, and the right vision. And you could see, I bet President Genshaft said vision about 25 times in her remarks. In innovation now, there is a new intersection of research and technology. Uh, if you talk to any of the young students in medicine, in nursing, in engineering now, 
they don't, and they, their whole practice is going to be uh, integrated with the latest technology. They carry their iPads around, they deal on their iPhones, they are always, uh, they always have the technological tools at their disposal. And they expect this kind of training. It's no longer go to the conference, sit in a boring lecture. They know that uh, to be, uh, to have that commitment to excellence and understanding and uh, have the best treatment for their patients, they expect uh, this modern type of uh, training. So it, you, what you will see from this point forward with this intersection of health innovation and technology Medical devices will come at a faster pace, cures will, co will come at a faster pace, and that will bring great benefits uh, for all of us. Grants and research. The univer no other university in the country has grown as fast as the University of South Florida. We now are a magnet for grants uh, and research dollars. And my primary committee in the United States Congress has oversight the National Institutes of Health and the Nas uh, National Cancer Institute, uh, all of health policy. I also chair a uh, health innovations task force in the Congress. The University of South Florida now is getting everyone's attention. Uh, we are on the move. We, uh, there, some of those other institutions are kind of stuck in a rut. They've uh, gotten a little bit lazy. And see, we're a young institution. We're a unified community. We're scrappy, aren't we? Uh, and we're going to fight for every research dollar and every job to come to this community. And we, in doing so, we're going to inspire all of the young people across the country that have choices about where they will go. Uh, they will understand that Tampa Bay is the place to be. And if the Beck Group and Mayor Buckhorn can build buildings as fast as this one came out of the ground, uh, you're going to see you're going to see great things uh, for the Tampa Bay area. All of that combined with the vision for excellence and health innovation uh, would not be possible without the leaders here in this room. President Genshaft has, during her tenure here, just inspired this entire community to fight for what is right. To, we understand now that the University of South Florida is what makes uh, the Tampa Bay area uh, a wonderful place to live. We, it is the most important economic engine. Uh, and doctor, does anyone have more energy than Dr. Clasco? <laughs> I don't think so. And really due to his vision and energy, this is possible today. He inspires this wonderful team in USF Health. And Dr. Sutherland, congratulations on the grand opening today. Uh, what that takes are partners like Carol and Frank Marsani as well, who have, have had this vision of excellence uh, for the university for many, many years. And we are so fortunate to have philanthropists like the Morsanis uh, in this community that can match the resources uh, with the vision and make it become a reality. Uh, but the USF trustees, all of our partners, uh, the, the entire USF family and the Tampa Bay community, uh, thanks to USF and CAMELS, health innovation is our future and the future is very bright. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Representative Castor. And um, so we've had exactly 18 minutes that we can be satisfied with ourselves, and now Mayor Buckhorn is going to tell us what our next project needs to be. And actually, Mayor, th this cartoon was meant for you because, um, you know, I know how you feel about that. Whenever we're not on the boat and we're relaxing for a little bit, you you, you keep saying there's more. So this is this was meant for uh, uh, for your introduction, Mayor Buckhorn. Uh, uh, has just been a, a really, really great inspiration to us all about what this city can be. But not only that, you heard a lot from Representative Castor and President Genshaft about teamwork. And what we're excited about as, as uh, folks that are living and working in the community is that we're seeing a level of cooperation between the city and the county uh, that's unprecedented. People are talking about Tampa Bay, and it's a, a good part uh, due to the leadership that exists today in Mayor Buckhorn. So, Mayor, we're ready to hear what our next, uh, our next steps are. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can I have all those uh, industry partners stand up for a second? Come on. I'm the mayor. <laughs> we have leases with all of your company names ready for you when you, when, when you leave today because we want you here in Tampa, Florida. I didn't travel 12 hours to Israel, Gary, to talk to Symbionics because you're cute. It's okay, you can sit down. <laughs> Dr. Clasco, this, this is an exciting day. It's, uh, I hope all of you took notice to the fact that, that this building got its CO on Saturday. It took me 20 damn years to get this job. I'm working every day of the week. <laughs> so to all of you that made this possible, to my predecessor, Mayor Iorio, who started this process, and to her staff, and certainly to uh, the city staff, many of whom are represented here, who, who make me look good every day. Thank you for getting this done. You know, for the last year, there hasn't been a speech that I have given that I haven't talked about camels and talked about the importance of camels and talked about what camels and what USF means to this community and talked about what a, what a powerful economic engine this is and how this university and this building right here is going to help change Tampa's economic DNA. This is what the future looks like. These are the kinds of jobs that Kathy and I, our two daughters, will come home to someday. Because I didn't run for this office to lose our best and brightest talent to Charlotte, North Carolina, and to Austin, Texas, and to Raleigh, Durham, and to San Diego. I want those kids here. And these are the kinds of jobs and these are the kinds of opportunities that will allow that to happen. This is transformative, not just for health care, but for Tampa. This day, this ribbon cutting, is going to send a signal to the world. And next August, when the entire eyes of the world are watching this community, we're going to tell the message of prosperity. We're going to tell the message of hope. We're going to tell the message of value-added jobs that are being created here every day. We're going to talk about camels. We're going to talk about where this city is in its journey. We're going to talk about how we've turned the generational page. We're going to talk about how we've written a new chapter in Tampa's history, and it begins right here, right now. And I will tell you this, to all of you that have been engaged in this, to all of you who have believed in this, to all of you who have believed in USF and its capacity to be an economic engine that will drive this Tampa Bay economy, and to all of you who have believed in Tampa and our capacity to be a great city, this is our turn. This, ladies and gentlemen, what you see here is our destiny. This is where our glorious history and our hope for a better future begin. Thank you. And get those leases signed. <laughs>I said, uh, I said when I started, this, this is like no other place. And it's not just that we are the largest freestanding assessment of technical and teamwork competence center in the United States. It's that up till today, you had your choice. There were entrepreneurial simulation centers. There were places that worked with industry and did this as a profit-making uh, enterprise. There were academic simulation and assessment centers that were housed in a university, they were very singular, they were just based on the, on the university. There has never been before been an entrepreneurial academic center like this one is, and that's what really makes it special, bringing the industry partners together with the specialty societies. Um, industry is not quite as hierarchical as academics. Yesterday, I, I'm an OBGYN, I had to explain to the uh, head of the, Amer the uh, EVP of the American College of OBGYN while he was on the bottom. I tried to tell him it was anatomically correct, the heart and then the abdomen, but <laughs> he didn't buy that. So, so, so we're going to uh, reverse it. We're going to reverse it this time, and I'm going to start with uh, 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 the most important specialty of OBGYN and introduce um, uh, Dr. Hal Lawrence, who has been a, a good friend and colleague and really a great leader as the Executive Vice President of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. It's an incredibly important time for specialty societies. The three specialty societies you're about to hear from have really taken the lead and worked with camels around this very exciting venture. So it's my indeed uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, my old friend and colleague and now leader, Dr. Hal Lawrence.
Well, well, good morning, and what a great day in Tampa Bay. Uh, this is this is just so exciting. I I I will tell you, having lived in Washington D.C. now for a little bit over four years, one of the things you learn really quickly is it's dangerous as a physician to follow a series of politicians. <laughs> and actually, Representative Castor, I think I've had the opportunity of testifying uh, on your subcommittee on energy and commerce about prematurity uh, a year or two back. So it's great to see you here this morning. You know, I am pleased to be here at this great grand opening celebration for the Center for Advanced Medical Learning and Simulation here in Tampa Bay. Today, represents the culmination of the efforts of so many here, not only at the uh, University of South Florida, but here in Tampa. I have known Steve, as he just reflected, uh, for many years, and he's doing such a great job here as Dean of the Morrisani uh, College of Medicine at USF. And I share your enthusiasm and excitement for the future of teaching this facility uh, represents. The American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists is very proud to have worked with USF in creating and helping to conceptualize this great center. Dr. Sterling Williams, our Vice President for Education, and Dr. Charles B. Hammond, our college's 53rd president and the past chair of OBGYN at Duke University, are both here this morning. Chuck and Sterling, stand up back there. Or why are you there? They've been part of this the whole time. And they have been instrumental in carrying ACOG's support for this center, engaging in the design process of this wonderfully state-of-the-art facility, which I got to walk through last night, and you, you guys are in for a treat. It's just unbelievable. And into helping to develop the programming that, of what this, what this institution will be able to do. You know, you've heard it alluded to already several times, but technology and evolution, or revolution, go hand in hand. And nowhere is this more acutely focused than in, than in the world of education. You know, changes abound in the ways our students gain knowledge and how our residents and fellows and clinicians maintain and expand their skills. You know, while most of us learned going to lectures, reading chapters for our didactic knowledge, and then being shepherded, if we were physicians, being shepherded through procedures on patients for our clinical skills. There's a whole new group of modalities out there that offer an array of options for future education. Today, electronic tools enable students at every level to have instant access to the information that previously we all had to memorize. And now, the very real simulation models, medical students and residents will be able to, using those very real simulation models, medical students and residents and fellows will be able to practice the procedures and hone their skills in an environment without risk to patients. These simulation tools will not only facilitate training in preparation for real procedures, but they may well also help medical students identify the areas that, that they really have a, 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 a attraction to or a talent in and pick their field of medicine. And as an obstetrician getting ready to deliver those thousands of babies, it's it's great for medical students to have the benefit of practicing a few times on a, on a simulation model before they do a real delivery. You know, I, when I walked through last night, I could see you, how you learn to initiate anesthesia, how do you learn to perform resuscitations, whether it's on an adult or a newborn, and now that can all be taught with an interactive model. Newer programmable simulation devices are going to be able to help the evolving clinician deal with lots of variety of difficult surgical challenges in the simulation world before in the operating room. And this is really important. Some of you are familiar with a lot of medical education, some of you are not, but you know, we are now working in the world of restricted resident work hours. And so the ability to access procedural training through simulation lessens the limitation of being able to have to find the right case when I'm on the right rotation to get that right skill. Now it's available whenever. And practicing uh, clinicians wishing to expand their procedural skills will be able to learn in this great simulation environment. This process of lifelong learning <coughs> and practicing will really have great benefit in patient safety. You know, and it's not only from the educational perspective. The American Board of Medical Specialties has mandated that all board certified physicians continue to be reevaluated throughout their careers through what's called a maintenance of certification process. 
And additionally, the Federation of State Medical Licensing Boards is establishing something called maintenance of licensure. So MOC and MOL are both aiming to ensure that practicing physicians maintain their knowledge and their clinical skills. Simulation centers such as this great one right here at Camels and here at USF will assist physicians in helping them to be evaluated, helping them to maintain their skills and privileges so that they can provide the best care to their patients. As many of you know, ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, is an educational organization. And we produce postgraduate courses, some of which are freestanding, some of which occur at our annual meeting or at different district meetings around the country. And we are looking forward to the opportunity to work with CAMELS, uh, right here with the staff at CAMELS, to co-sponsor potential courses, both in obstetrics and in gynecology. You know, we've had the opportunity to utilize other simulation centers, not quite as grand as this one, in this way, and have found that they really work well to provide hand-on training for people who want to come to these freestanding courses. You know, the ACOG Simulation cons Consortium, of which Campbell's was a founding member, uh, has facilitated the efforts in creating courses at centers, which are all part of that consortium. And we really look forward, Steve, to working with you all here uh, to make that happen. Now, finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't reflect about a CREOG. I got to tell, because most of you don't know what CREOG is, it's the Council on Resident Education and Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Williams oversees it. Well, about 15 or 17 years ago, there was this unbelievable presentation at CREOG given by your dean, Dr. Stephen Clasco. Now, if you have not had the opportunity to see Dr. Clasco's rendition, uh, Redition of Star Wars, <laughs> you've got to get it. And now I strongly suggest you go to Steve and you ask. Now, when I saw it, it was on a, a VHS videotape. <laughs> you know, I bet Steve has jumped to at least to the late 20th century and put it on a DVD. But we'll all give him super extra credit points, President, uh, <laughs> if, if he's already uploaded it on YouTube. <laughs> See, you know, I say this, it was a great, it was a, it was a, it was a great uh, video, but I say it because it showed how creative Dr. Stephen Clasco is, and this center represents another part of that creativity. So from ACOG, I thank you again for the opportunity to join you and congratulate all of the faculty, administration here at USF and the city of Tampa, uh, for this is an outstanding place and a great center for advanced medical learning and simulation. Thank you all very much, and great day. Yeah, I sort of had to leave the OBGYN sphere after that. The, the president was Doug Lalby. I, I made Obi-Wan Kenobi, OBGYN Doug Kalalbi, and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure he took that well. Um, um, this is a team sport, and one of the things that we're incredibly excited about is the Camels becomes more than just a building, it becomes a brand identity for partnerships in the assessment of technical and teamwork competence. And we're thrilled that uh, USF is partnering uh, with uh, great other universities as well as industry, as well as specialty societies. And, and there's no better example of this uh, than Dr. Carlos Pellegrini, who's the uh, Henry Anna Harkins Professor and Chair of Surgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's the current president of the Society of Surgical Chairs, a director of the American Board of Surgery, chair of the American College of Surgeons Accreditation Review Committee, and the immediate past chair of the American College of Surgeons Board of Regents and the former president of the American Surgical Association. It's just about anything you can be in surgery, Dr. Pellegrini has been. And we're working with him and a group of other places to make sure that from this moment on, robotics training, the people behind the robot, the doctors behind the robot, the nurses uh, that are involved in robotics are literally uh, uh, validated and trained. So Dr. Pellegrini, it's really an honor to have you here as part of this celebration. Good morning. President Genshaw, uh, Dean Clasco, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted, uh, like many of you are, to have been asked, uh, in my, my case, by a former trainee of mine, a camera that arms, and now the 
a distinguished chief medical director of this facility, to uh, provide some remarks at the opening of the Center for Advanced Medical Learning and Simulation here at USF. Like you, I stand in awe of what has been accomplished. This is a product of a vision expressed by Dean Clasco in his, as one of the four major strategic uh, parts of the institute that he called the optimistic future in healthcare. And I must recognize, <laughs> perhaps because I live on the West Coast, but I've never seen the word optimistic and healthcare together. It's almost <laughs> like, an, it's almost like a, an oxymoron. My hat is off to you, Dr. Clasco, for having had the courage to carry out something that exceeds everyone's expectations and for doing so at such a crucial time. Because this is, in fact, a crucial time in the training of health professionals. A time like no other in history of medical education, a time in which we, the educators, are asked to provide health professionals that not only master the science of medicine, but incorporate the ability to apply the science in a very rational, efficient way to the delivery of medical care. It's not good enough to have the best pharmaceuticals, the best devices, the best medications available, but they have to be provided for the right indication, for the right time, at the right place, and for the right patient. This center is strategically designed to respond to this social imperative. And let me tell you why I say that. I say that for four reasons. First, the center will be using simulation and modeling anchored in well-designed curricula to teach students, to teach residents, to teach physicians in practice, to provide the entire continuum in the professional development of individuals. This puts an end to an archaic method of reading from books and then using patients to learn medicine. Simulation is, center, is, is, is learner centered. It is concerned only with the needs of the learner. It is reproducible, and most importantly, it gives the permission to fail. And permission to fail is extremely important in learning, in the acquisition of skills. And it is so because one can practice without the fear of inflicting pain, <laughs> inflicting suffering, inflicting sequela of the errors that almost every human being makes during the process of learning. And modern simulation goes a step further. It provides methods to learn not only the right way to do things, but also the way to make errors, the way to recognize errors when they happen, and the way to rescue from errors that have occurred. And that is unique to simulation. That cannot be done in the practice of medicine. Second reason is that this center emphasizes interprofessional education. This learning together of all the parts of the healthcare team, <coughs> incorporating nursing, physician assistants, residents, physicians in practice, etc., is the integration, is a concept that produces high performance teams to create to care for human beings. This concept of interprofessional education has become an important social imperative in the training of health professionals today. Third, the center will offer accurate, complete, and timely feedback to the learners, perhaps the single most important element in the learning process. The ability of simulators to provide scores that can serve as individual challenges for the learner improves the acquisition of skills. The fact that the teachers can use those scores to compare the performance of a learner against validated norms and benchmarks cannot be overstated. Fourth, with the ability of this course, we can now train learners with a different concept. We can train learners to achieve a certain level of proficiency. No longer is time in place what will determine your ability to practice, but is the achievement of that level of proficiency that has been tested, that has been demonstrated, that has been observed by others, that then gives you so that the, the, the ability to go in and practice medicine. This concept has become most important in training individuals, not only in medicine, but also in the so-called high consequence industries. It is rather simple. It is a concept 
that makes safety a priority. And that means that one cannot do something until one knows how to do something. When Steve Glasgow was saying that he delivers so many babies and I know that he's so busy and he's so energetic doing so many things, it's hard to say. But if he were to go today and deliver another baby, he could do that. And perhaps he hasn't done that for a long time. And he hasn't demonstrated his ability to do that. <laughs> and, and that in itself is dangerous. When the next speaker speaks, he is a pilot in aviation. He is supposed to have flown an X number of hours and be certified X number of months before he does that in that particular type of aircraft. And that is not something we still have in, 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 medi in medicine. So it was with that in mind that in 2005, the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons created a committee that was charged with enhancing education of surgeons, using simulation and improving to improve outcome and safety of patients. After looking at a series of alternatives that we had at the time, our group chose not to have the college create a center itself, but instead have the college focus our work in the creation of standards and in the accreditation process itself. Through the creation and eventual evolution of these standards, we felt we could catalyze the use of simulation throughout the country, leaving it to hospitals and medical schools such as USSF, USF, to apply these criteria and to develop their own centers. We have now accredited 65 centers, and I'm proud to say USF is one of the centers that early on participated successfully in the accreditation process and is fully accredited by the American College of Surgeons uh, Educational Institute pro program. Each center accredited by the college is asked to provide the learners for uh, provide an opportunity for all learners to emphasize interprofessional aspects. Each center is asked to become a resource for the entire community, such as you have seen today, and to serve not just surgeons, but to serve the entire healthcare team and to train the entire he healthcare team. It has been interesting to see that each one of the centers that we have accredited has acquired its own, so to speak, personality, its own unique abilities, and it was because we wanted to profit from the wisdom of the crowd that we created a network of accredited centers, a network that is now four years old, and a network that is establishing a number of new criteria, new curricula, and uniformity throughout the training system. As part of that, we run courses every year, and I am delighted to say to the mayor that was asking for more people to come to USF and to the dean that uh, the, the American College of Surgeons has selected Tampa and CAMELS as its center for the course in 2014, so we will all be here <laughs> with our partners. As I look at CAMELS today, I must confess that it exceeds every bit of the expectations that I personally had and my group had when we conceptualized at the college what an education and a training center would be. CAMELS expects to use innovation to take simulation to a completely different level. It is, in fact, transforming. For example, in the not-too-distant future, it will be possible to import into simulators patient-specific data from CTs, from MRs, and from other sources that contain information about the patient. We can now recreate in a virtual manner a patient and a disease, and we can then treat that patient and disease in camels in the not-too-distant future. Just imagine for a second what it would be like when we can perform an operation, rehearse, if you wish, an operation on a virtual patient that has the exact same disease that the patient we're going to be operating the next day, practice it a couple of times, see what happens if we make a mistake, recover from that mistake, recognize it, etc. Furthermore, using simulation techniques and virtual patients, we may be able to accelerate the pace of development of pharmaceuticals and devices. Many industries today use simulation in the development of new products, trying in rapid succession a myriad of potential scenarios that allow the researchers to come up with the right solution much faster than we did before. This is what is in store for camels. These goals <coughs> are audacious, but then without audacious goals, we would have never landed in the moon. Without audacious goals, we would not be using the iPad. And without audacious goals, we would probably not have electronic medical records either. I don't know whether that's bad or good, <laughs> but we would still be <coughs> writing our histories in paper. 
I personally love the concept of audacious goals such as those that have been established here. I am quite aware that frequently such goals may not be achievable. Their value, as I see it, is that they set direction of travel. They provide us the guidance, and they frequently allow us to reach higher and further than we would have otherwise be capable of. In the words of Michelangelo, the greatest danger that most of us face is not that our aim is too high and we don't get to it, it's that we set it too low and we reach it too fast. Let me conclude my remarks using a quote that I found on the website when I was looking at Dean Clasco. In his website, he wrote, we intend to be the leaders of the revolution that will transform the future of healthcare education and healthcare delivery, not by changing the existing reality, but by creating a new model that makes the old model obsolete. With the opening of CAMELS, Dr. Clasco has delivered for UCSF and for this community just that. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you. So I guess, Kathy, you got to put me on call more now, so I get enough. Uh, <laughs> um, I, just two things that, that, that Dr. Pellegrini said that I want to make sure everybody understands. We plan on bringing 30,000 physicians to Tampa Bay. And, um, you know, the, the only negative, yeah, we can clap for that, because that is for the, for the point. The only thing we'll have to worry about is that everybody will want to stay here and they won't want to go back home. And we're really excited about everything they'll get to see here. The other thing is that, um, this really is global, and it's not just partnerships in the United States. You're going to hear a lot over the next year of things we're, that we're looking at doing with camels in Latin America and Asia and others. So literally, camels will become a brand identity around the world. I mentioned to you that we have uh, two very important uh, announcements, and I will actually, I'll, for the press, I'll, I'll tell them that both of these will have uh, press releases uh, associated with them. And uh, the first allows me to uh, welcome uh, a new friend, uh, and a great leader, uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick, who's the Senior Vice President uh, for Development and Entrepreneurship for the American College of uh, Cardiology. Uh, Dr. Fitzpat uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick is a, also a founder and serves on the editorial board of a new medical journal, Medical Innovation in Business. It sounds like uh, something you would start, Judy. It's exactly what we're all about. Uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick has been honored with several uh, national awards and is the recipient of the Smithsonian Institute Computer World Health Healthcare Computing Innovation Award. Uh, I got uh, invited by uh, uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick to come out to Chicago to the uh, uh, National American College of Cardiology um, uh, uh, Convention to uh, actually uh, find out about what's, what he's about to announce, and I couldn't be more excited. Got to spend a lot of time with more cardiologists than I ever hoped to see again. Sorry, Wes, but <laughs> true story. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to welcome Mr. Kevin Fitzpatrick. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, President Genshaft and um, uh, Representative Castor, Mayor Buckhorn, trustees, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here and to offer you con congratulations and greetings from the 40,000 domestic and international members of the American College of, uh, of Cardiology. And I was wondering why I felt so at home here. And I, I recognize, like, reflecting back on our CEO, Dr. Jack Lewin, he combines the energy of Steve and, and the ambition of the mayor. <laughs> and um, uh, so it, it's kind of exhausting, but we accomplish a lot that <laughs> way. Uh, so um, it, it's great to be here. You know, I'd also like to, uh, to acknowledge the, uh, the senior leadership of our sister medical societies. And uh, I thought it was wonderful that we all had a chance to reflect on the importance of CAMELS from our different perspectives. I think the multidisciplinary approach to care that we represent by our presence here is exactly in keeping with the strategic imperative of, uh, of, this, uh, of this organization uh, and this building and this philosophy. And I think it's absolutely essential to the, uh, the future accomplishments that we hope to achieve. I'd also like to acknowledge the remarkable, I mean, absolutely remarkable public-private partnership that is occurring here. 
demonstrated by uh, the reimagining of healthcare in Central Florida, and it's incredibly exciting to see. Uh, in the audience tonight, today are, are not only prominent uh, faculty and staff, but also the mayor and his team, the Economic Development Council from Hillsborough County, and uh, I get to travel the country and talk to smart, ambitious people all the time, but I have never seen this type of critical mass of energy and focus uh, brought to bear at one point in time, and so I applaud and, uh, uh, and congratulate you on, on all of that. I'd like to make uh, sort of two points today. I'd like to talk a little bit about the American College of Cardiology and where we're going strategically so you have some context for why we're so excited to be here. I'd also like to reflect upon the things that we see the ability to accomplish here that we don't see anywhere else and, and the, the very uniqueness of this uh, incredible team that you brought together. The ACC, as I mentioned, is a 40,000 member organization devoted to training, uh, ev developing evidence-based guidelines that have come to define the standards of CV care worldwide. Now, the crown jewels of the ACC is a patient registry where we've been collecting uh, 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 clinical data on patients from over 2,400 hospitals around the world. We have 15 million patient records, and that forms a data repository that drives the evidence-based guidelines that set the standards of care worldwide. We see the ability to bring that type of evidence-based approach here to the University of South Florida, to this healthcare system, and to really uh, bring that to the next level of, uh, of integration into the practices of care at the bedside. A very exciting opportunity here. Now, the ACC was originally con conceived as an organization by and for physicians, and that, that is right and proper. But to, uh, we, rec we recognize that where medicine is evolving is the team approach to care. A, a, again, a philosophy that is foundational to what's happening here at Camels. And so now the ACC has expanded its membership to include nurses, PAs, pharmacists, health administrators, all the members of the cardiovascular t care team, because we recognize that without that team approach, without that multidisciplinary approach, we're going to fall short in our efforts to improve the highest, uh, deliver the highest quality of care. And so, uh, you know, we're delighted, again, to have our sister societies here with us today and to, uh, to have an, an organization that we can partner with that's committed to that same multidisciplinary uh, approach to care. So if you look at the ACC today, what do you see? You see an organization that is growing. It's evolving to meet the challenges of a changing healthcare environment. It's using data to guide a relentless focus on quality improvement. And it's bringing together new constituencies of patients and providers in a team approach to care. Kind of sounds like USF, doesn't it? And that's why we're so excited to be here today. Uh, we, we really, uh, again, appreciate and respect the, uh, the incredible strategic thinking that's occurring here in Hillsborough County with remarkable entities such as USF, the City of Tampa, the Pepin Heart Institute, the Moffitt Cancer Center, M2Gen Biorepository, and now CAMELS coming online to bring together a uniquely powerful, exceptionally talented system of healthcare. Uh, again, unlike anything else that, uh, that we've seen and powered by a unique public-private partnership that is, uh, that is just stunning. As we've gotten to know this city, this healthcare system, uh, and we've quickly recognized that we found an ideal innovation partner, and we were so anxious to actually get started here that we were running classes through this facility before the, uh, bef before the facility was even uh, licensed. I don't know if we were, was, was that legal to do that? <laughs> I guess. All right, all right, all right. Mayor, <laughs> Steve said it was okay. Steve said it was okay. Thank you, Mayor. It's kind of a, a retroactive approval, I think, so. I'm a deputy. <laughs> He does marriages, too, on the ship, I think. So, um, uh, but, uh, so you know, uh, it's also true that uh, the hybrid lab that Philips has, uh, has worked with you to, to uh, install here, that many of you might have seen last night, some will see today, the entire cardiovascular community is looking at this facility uh, and looking at the, the uh, remarkable opportunity to have a hybrid lab devoted to training and what that can do in terms of the safe diffusion of new technologies that are coming online, such as the transcatheter valve. So we, um, we are delighted to have this partnership, and we know that we live in a time of uncertainty in healthcare. 
And uh, people question America's ability to innovate. They certainly question healthcare's in in uh, inability to, uh, ability to, uh, to innovate. And I would say to the doubters, come to Tampa, come to USF, look at what's happening here and see a vision of the future where we have a community of people who believe in each other, believe in a shared future, and believe in a pathway that if you focus on the patient and you focus on improving outcomes, you can't go far wrong. And uh, we certainly share the, that belief system, which is why we're so incredibly happy to have this partnership. And so I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to announce uh, that, uh, and I'll, I'll grab this plaque, that the American College of Cardiology has officially recognized CAMELS as our first and only uh, center of excellence in education and training. And we look forward to a long and very successful <laughs> history working together. That is a great honor, and we are incredibly excited. I found out about this for the first time uh, when I was in Chicago. Let me sort of just give you two seconds of where this all comes together. Uh, Kevin and, and his team first came, came down. So, you know, we built uh, uh, this university around excellence, and we had the opportunity to do a national search for a cardiovascular sciences chair. We're one of the few places that actually has a department of cardiovascular sciences because we believe uh, – uh, that the heart is important, and uh, both academically and clinically. And um, uh, we, we were pleased to be able to bring in Dr. Les Miller uh, just a little over a year ago, who's uh, literally one of the leaders in the country at looking at uh, molecular genomics and personalized medicine. So we originally, I think, brought you down to look at that option to be a pilot uh, for what is becoming a very exciting part of, of USF and USF Health, molecular genomics and personalized medicine. In fact, we're working with the county uh, around supporting that. We, we're working with Speaker Weatherford and the Florida Legislature uh, for a heart institute. And then uh, they had an opportunity to also see, they had known what we were doing, but actually see what had actually been here. And it starts to bring everything together. When I talk about bringing everything together, think about this in Tampa Bay. We will be the only place I would imagine in the country that has the state's designated cancer center, Moffitt Cancer Center, and a great partner of USF, the state's designated Alzheimer's Center, which, by the way, is doing amazing work. I think Dave Morgan is here. Dave, thank you for everything you do. Uh, we have the number one, just got the data today, number one diabetes researcher, NIH-funded researcher in the country, and we've now got the USF Diabetes Center, so we have a diabetes center of excellence. And we're looking forward to be the state's designated personalized medicine uh, and heart institute. All right here in Tampa Bay, and uh, that's due to the leadership of the people uh, that you've heard of before. So we couldn't be more excited about this. And Kevin, uh, on behalf of you and Ron and Jack, this is a great honor for us, and we will put this up very, very, very proudly. So um, the other uh, announcement I want to make, um, Gary, can, could you, Gary Zambor, could you just come up for a second? Um, we have a, a, a lot of great partners, and uh, one of the things that I said um, earlier was that um, our partners are not vendors. Uh, we don't view them that way. They don't view us that way. And one of the great things about um, our partners is they are committed uh, to the education of a new generation of uh, physicians and nurses. Symbionics has been a great partner from the beginning, one of the, one of the really world's leaders in simulation technology, a small company. But despite being a small company, um, they uh, announced to us that they will be the first sponsor of the CAMELS Fellowship in Met Medical Simulation. We'll develop uh, leadership in healthcare simulation education and training to enhance patient and reduce medical errors. So this will be the first fellowship of its kind in the country. It'll be right here in Tampa Bay. And uh, thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate it on behalf of the city. I just, um, I don't want to steal Steve's thunder, but we also have a large plaque, and it was brought down here, and Steve and I couldn't even hold it up. It's quite heavy. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be placed somewhere on, on the, uh, on somewhere in the camels, uh, um, or, you know, the situation here outside. I do want to say just a couple words, not, not go offline, but 
We've been involved with the, the people here at Camels for over five and a half years. Deb, Steve, Judge, I mean President Judy, you know, I mean, and, and I can, <laughs> you're so much more dynamic. <laughs> and um, I, I just want to say that before this fantastic facility has been put up, that um, we've had a chance to, to work around the world as a leading surgical simulation company starting back in 1997 and trying to improve patient outcomes and safety. But it's really not about even this beautiful, unbelievable site. It's like nothing we've seen anywhere in the world, and we've seen a lot. I just want to say that the Symbionics is truly and my colleagues at Symbionics, our president, Ronnie, uh, we are truly honored to partner, and the mayor, who never stops bugging us to get down here. <laughs> we are truly honored to, uh, to be uh, participants and partners with the people here at, at uh, Camels and USF. And this is so much more about the uniqueness and the vision and the over-horizon vision of the crew here that it's just amazing. I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and see simulation advanced uh, training centers all over the world, places you couldn't imagine. You had to take a donkey to, to even get to part of them. But there is nothing like the leadership and the vision of USF and the team here. And so, Judy, I am going to say, go Bulls. <laughs> and thank you very much. Mayor, I think we have a strategy. Yeah, he, told, he told me that he was walking his dog in Cleveland and he was freezing. So we got to find out what the temperature is and, and maybe we should talk to his dog and uh, try, to get, try to get his dog to Tampa. <laughs> yeah, how many mayors are going to offer to walk your dog, Gary? I mean, seriously. Um, so, so there's going to be a lot of firsts at Camels. I mean, this is really just the beginning. And, um, one of those firsts that you'll be hearing a lot about will be the close collaboration between CAMELS and the pioneers for safety in aviation. Uh, the av aviation field has been a leader in simulation. We're talking to the crew resource management teams from uh, Boeing, from uh, some other uh, airline industry folks. And these are things that we're teaching right here in CAMELS. We think we can learn a lot from them as it relates to quality and safety. Pilots know that uh, practice and teamwork pay off in a crisis. And there's no better person to herald uh, that uh, than uh, a true American hero, uh, Jeff Skiles, who was the co-pilot of the plane we all now know as uh, the Miracle of the Hudson. What you will hear, though, uh, what you will hear, uh, not to presage what he's going to say, is that he doesn't view himself as a hero. That's what he simulated. That's what he learned. And that's where we want to get to in medicine. I'm really, really pleased and honored uh, that Captain Jeff Skiles is willing to come here and help us open camels. Captain? You know, just two days ago, I was having a conference call with Dr. Armstrong about this event, and he expressed that this is a, a highly scripted morning. I could speak for no more than 25 minutes, and I must be off the stage by 10 a.m. sharp. <laughs> So thank you for listening. <laughs> now, now, I'm honored to be here today to share this moment with you all with this opening of this fabulous facility. And, and, and I've already taken the tour. And I can tell you that this, that this facility will be instrumental in development of high quality health care and have a positive effect on patient safety in this nation. Now, medicine has embarked on a path of constant improvement, very similar to the one that, that we have traveled in the airline industry. I'm here because of the notoriety that, that I have gained from being a part of the miracle in the Hudson. But I'm also here because of the decades of development of safety systems that, that allowed Sully and I to be successful in our moment of crisis. On January 15, 2009, Sully and I were faced with a situation of tremendous peril. But it was also an event that through practice and simulation, we had prepared for our entire lives.
Just the Friday before, I had completed a month and a half of training on the Airbus 320 that we were flying. This happened to be my first trip on the line in that airplane. And it was also my first trip with Sully. I'd never even met the man before that trip started. But as pilots, we can't depend on knowing the people that we're flying with. We have to use our, our training and our, our simulation to be able to act as a team from the very first moment we sat down together. We just departed runway four at LaGuardia on a cold day in January. Climbing through 3,000 3, feet, something caught my eye. And I looked up and slightly to the right, but still right ahead, was a big flock of geese. Too close to maneuver around. And then I heard Sully say birds. A and that fast we were on top of them. It sounded like flying through hail as their bodies impacted the fuselage, the wings, and two geese went through the core of each engine. I was thinking that we had to assess the damage and, and, and try to figure out a plan. And then both engines died. The high whining sound that they made at climb power just suddenly disappeared. And all we could hear was just the slipstream rushing past. The shock of the situation made me feel like my head had, had swollen and I was looking at the world through a fog. But what I did know was my immediate actions because I had practiced them over and over in training situations, in simulations. I grabbed my, what we call a quick reference handbook, which is a tool that we use. 176 page book of <laughs> emergency procedures and data. But to show the value, it even has a system for how we, we access it. Within 20 seconds of hitting the birds, I was on the correct procedure and I was starting to run it. And I was fortunate because this particular one I had practiced in the simulator two weeks before as part of my training. We have a specific protocol that we use that guides every moment that we spend together in the cockpit. That's how we work together as a team. Even in a moment of extreme stress and confusion, the training that we had received for decades came to the surface, and we knew what to do. The specific systems of operations that we use and practice in training simulation provided us with an avenue to assess our situation and a process to solve our problem. These are the same systems developing in the medical industry through institutions of learning and research like the University of Southern Florida. Many people want to call me a hero or credit a miracle for the success of U.S. Airways Flight 1549. But this was not a story of individual achievement. This was a story of organizational change and emphasis on safety awareness that has transformed the airline industry over the last 20 years. Within aviation, this incident was viewed as a validation of the journey that we have taken in safety engineering. And there are many, many parallels between aviation and medicine. What is shared by both industries, I think, is the challenge of training and evaluating personnel who must act instantly as teams in ever-changing environments and with absolutely zero margin for error. In aviation, we long ago embraced simulation and have built upon that foundation to transform passenger safety. That transformation is reflected in the, the stellar safety record enjoyed by U.S. major airlines today. Discounting accidents at regional carriers that by and large don't follow the safety practices that we've developed at the major airline level. The last fatal accident in, to a U.S. major airline was in October 2001. Over 10 years without a fatal accident. Now this is in a very large part due to the advancements in human factors engineering and organizational safety management embraced by major airline safety departments. These benefits are also inherent here at, at CAMELS. What this facility, or, or I'm sorry, uh, medical care will be taking a bold new step towards advancing high quality health care in Florida and throughout this country. In aviation, the development of effective simulation changed our training environment from merely testing and rating previously learned abilities to actually training new behaviors and techniques. In aviation, simulation's value is not merely the obvious impact on improved performance, 
but it also has economic and, and safety overtones for us. Simulators are much less expensive than flying actual airplanes. And the long list of pilots that had lost their lives in training accidents was halted with the introduction of effective simulation devices. Likewise, this medical simulation facility will change the face of patient safety by providing new avenues to train procedures, practice teamwork, and techniques in a non-threatening and non-jeopardy environment. While you might think that a simulator can't provide a real-world experience, I can tell you from 20 years, 27 years of training simulation, taking twice twice yearly check rides and having spent many months of my life in initial training for new aircraft types, that there can be no more effective means of training and testing for performance. I've spent, I'm sorry, uh, but this is still only the beginning of the journey. I'd like to take a little time to discuss the path that we are taking in aviation safety and that you are in many ways paralleling in healthcare and patient safety. And I'll allow you to draw your own conclusions of the value for medicine. When jet aircraft were introduced in the 1960s, their capability and reliability reduced whole classes of accidents, leaving what remained in a harsh light. The conclusion of too many accident reports was, was human error, or what we call pilot error, just mistakes that pilots make. Further study revealed that the crew really didn't possess the tools to work together as a team because the traditional relationships within the crew had not evolved since the early days of aviation. It was clear that further improvement in aviation safety wouldn't come from new technologies. It would come from managing the interpersonal relationships of the crew and changing the dynamics of how we operated and communicated. We had to build a team. To do this, we had to change our safety management and industry culture from a safety system based on the individual to a safety system based on the organization, the airline. This is the key overarching principle. We needed to develop an organizational approach to safety engineering and use simulation to translate that to the group. When we started this process, we had a few things going for us. We have extreme standardization of aircraft. The industry long ago had set the standard that it was more important to have standardized aircraft than to have the latest technology, believe it or not. When an airline purchases a new aircraft, it will be delivered with the identical controls, computers, and systems as the first aircraft of that fleet type that that airline purchased, even if that was 15 years before. To facilitate this standardization, airliners are produced in generations as opposed to having a new model every year like, say, a car might have. We had extreme standardization of processes. We already were very familiar and comfortable with using checklists and manuals, and we had defined training curriculum mandated by regulation. But our standardization efforts were largely aircraft-oriented. They weren't pilot-oriented. We didn't have a standard means of communicating with each, with each other and working well together. The first step in creating an organizational safety system was to build a team. And we did that by adopting what we initially called cockpit resource management, which was designed to break down the very hierarchical top-down management style inherent in airline cockpits of the day. We were actually required all crew members to challenge authority if they see errors or mistakes being made. But culture change doesn't happen by dictate. It took many, many years of peer-to-peer -peer training, classroom presentations to change a corporate and industry culture. It became so successful, though, that we expanded it to the entire crew and the flight attendants. And we changed cockpit resource management to crew resource management. And we met together to break down these barriers. In our simulator sessions, we'd film those simulator sessions, just like in this facility, and try to learn from our own behavior. We established crew briefings where we can, we can establish expectations and foster an immediate connection as a crew, which would allow the entire crew to view each other as individuals. Cockpit, or 
Cockpit resource management and briefings were designed to transform the crew from a more traditional management style to that of a team approach. It was not a process without speed bumps, but it has endured. But once we created the team, we had to move on to create a standardized workplace. We had extreme standardization of equipment, but little of process. We followed two central concepts of manufacturing, oddly enough, in the development of these systems. One of them was called process control. And what the basis of process control is, is that you can't control defects in the product without controlling the process by which that product was derived. In aviation, before we can address the causal factors of an error or an accident, we had to ensure that we had a standardized process in the cockpit to produce that. And another concept is quality assurance. In our world, creativity exploits new ideas or technologies to develop new and different product or outcome. But quality comes from repetition and from standardization. We used to treat flying as a creative pursuit. We thought a pilot should have as few limitations on them as possible to allow them to be able to practice their art. But what we came to find out is quality in aviation, which we define as aviation safety, can only come from controlling and standardizing the actions of the crew members involved. We developed standard operating procedures to, uh, to allow this to happen. By strictly following what we call SOPs, crew members have an, uh, an understanding of expected behavior, both for themselves and for those around them. SOPs allow crew members to act as a team. In the Miracle in the Hudson, Sully and I were engaged in unique and separate tasks. But because of standard operating procedures, we each knew what our responsibilities were, and we knew what to expect of each other. We developed integrated checklists and procedures to allow us to work together, uh, particularly with emergency checklists, which changed dramatically. But we didn't want to make procedures too complex. Uh, for instance, with a checklist, it's, it's long ago been understood that the longer a checklist is, the, less, or the more likely you are to perhaps miss an item on it. So we adopted a new procedures, which we're doing now, which is called flows. Because we have such incredibly standardized cockpits, I can walk into an uh, airplane that was produced yesterday, and it's going to look identical to one that was produced 20 years ago. We actually develop a flow pattern where we go through the cockpit in an ordered process, setting every switch, loading every computer, uh, testing every system. And we have a fair degree of confidence that we have accomplished it successfully because we started at one place and we ended at another. Then we use checklists just to verify the most important items. We change checklists from a read and do checklist to a actual check of items that were already accomplished. We developed triggers to develop guidance for crew members as to when they had to accomplish certain procedures. Because the, the first thing you do when you're, and, and uh, I'm sorry, checklist memory items should be kept to a minimum. Because the first thing you do when you're told to remember something is you forget it. <laughs> Another to tool that we use are things like this, like this quick reference handbook, which while it looks cumbersome is actually a, a big improvement on what we had before. We've now developed a crew, a standardized team, but flying an airplane is a very complex activity. There are thousands of variables. Airline accidents are rarely due to one cause, but rather they're inevit inevitably caused by a culmination of, of smaller mistakes that on any given day in just the right situation line up to cause an accident. If you break that chain, the accident doesn't happen. It's a very similar concept to medicine. But how do you find these smaller errors that can lead to an accident? We can sample what we've seen in training, but finding the errors that pilots are making in the field is much, much more difficult. So we develop programs for people to allow, to allow them to tell us what the mistakes that they're making. Uh, we will call ours at US Airways our Aviation Safety Action Program, which is a tailored program where we actually have a legal agreement between the airline, between the employees, and between the FAA that Within certain parameters, as long as we haven't done anything illegal, uh, if we just made a mental error that might have caused a, uh, a problem, we can admit that. 
The concept is, is that we would rather find the errors that the pilot group is making as a whole than to punish one individual for just a, a mistake. We have uh, airplanes that can actually downlink certain parameters to a computer system and provide data points of, of, of uh, mistakes that pilots are making. And we have uh, check pilots that will ride on our jump seats and they will observe how we operate and to make sure it's in stri strict compliance with our, with our procedures. They don't even tell us what we did wrong. They note it down and they leave and they de-identify it and all this information is de-identified and made into data points and computers. For instance, uh, when one of these check pilots leaves, maybe I said 80 knots instead of 80 on a takeoff roll call out. That's a point that would be marked down. What do we do with all this information? We have a safety department that analyzes all this data. And they're looking for trends and emerging threats. Our safety and tra training departments then develop compensatory solutions to address those threats. So we have crews accustomed to acting as a team. We have crews following standardized procedures and practices. We use data developed from sophisticated data analysis of the group to identify hazards and those links in that chain that can lead to an accident. We've developed procedural solutions to compensate for identified threats. And what do we do with that? That's where simulation comes into effect. Every year, we develop a new training scenario. We call it our advanced qualification program. Years ago, when I first started in aviation, we took a check ride every six months, and it was the exact same check ride. It's actually mandated by the FAA. You have to do these maneuvers to qualify. And it was a pass fail. And it was ironic because these were things we were never allowed to practice. And certainly, if we ever did them with passengers on board, we wouldn't be flying for long. <laughs> but, and yet, we had to come and validate that every six months. Well, it was decided that, you know, that really didn't make much sense. So what we now do now is we have a two-stage process. We go for a training day where we accomplish all of these, what you might call a skill maneuver, a physical skill maneuver. And if we don't do it right, well, then we back up. Our instructor says, gives us some feedback, and then we do it again. So we train to proficiency. Our actual check ride, which was our pass-fail, is what we call a line-oriented flight training where we are tested not on our physical skills, we're tested on how we work together as a crew, how we follow standard operating procedures, how we use our checklists, because that is deemed to be the more important thing to test for. Traditionally, aviation safety has been reactive, but now aviation safety is proactive. Those links in the chain that can lead to an accident are identified and severed before we face an adverse outcome. It's led to a new psychology in the cockpit. Traditionally, a captain's authority was based on fear. Now a captain's authority is based on respect for the captain's role in the crew. Captains, and also captains, respect and understand the role of the other crew members around them. We had an individual-based safety management system, and we transitioned to an organizational-based safety management system. The captain, or very similarly, the doctor still has the largest role in that, but he or she is supported by an overall organizational safety net. For both aviation and healthcare, an organizational approach to safety management employs all facets of the organization to combat, combat threats as they are identified and embraces constant change to create a learning organization to improve safety. Like in aviation, patient safety and the delivery of high co quality health care is not a goal that can ever be truly achieved. Safety will always be a continuum, a journey that will likely never nor should reach its destination. Health care's attention to patient safety, like aviation, is a constant, never ending effort. Quality simulation and training is something that pilots have depended on for their entire careers and simulation forms the basis for our aeronautical knowledge. CAMELS will chart a bold new course by expanding this to medicine. This medical simulation facility 
will be at the leading edge of the development of safety procedures and team development in medical practices, propelling the University of Southern Florida into the forefront of advancements in high-quality health care. Congratulations, and thank you.